Hello and welcome to Tate Google Hangout. Um, we are here in the, in, amongst Turners, I have to say, in Tate Britain, um, here to talk about photography and art. I'm Miranda Sawyer and I have five experts, two with me here and three brought to you by the magic of the internet. So I'll introduce them. First up we have Dr. Simon Baker, over here, wave to the camera. Good evening. Simon is Curator of Photography and International Art at Tate. And next to me, I have Miles Aldridge. He's a fashion photographer and artist. Do you want to wave, Miles? Hi. I have his book here, so I'll wave it. Acid Huge and sometimes erotically charged photography has been featured in Vogue, Numero, and the New York Times. And Miles recently held a retrospective at Somerset House entitled I Only Want You to Love Me. Now, via the magic of the internet, we are going to introduce our three other experts. First up, we have Fiona Crisp. Fiona, are you there? Hello, Fiona. Fiona is an artist who works with photography, and she's known for creating installations of large-scale photographs designed to question the presence of the photographic image. Fiona's work is represented in the Tate collection and was recently displayed as part of the Looking at the View exhibition at Tate Britain. Next up, we've got Gregory Barker. Gregory, are you there? Hello. <laughs> Gregory is a London-based editor and publisher, commissioning editor at Hot Shoe Magazine, which is the UK, UK's leading independent, independent contemporary photographic magazine and covers the best of established and up-and-coming photographers. And finally, last but not least, we have Michael O'Neill. Are you there, Michael? Are you going to pop up, Michael? We know you're there. There you are, Michael. Hiya. <laughs> Michael is an American photographer based in San Francisco. He's a former graphic designer, and his photography career was launched when he became one of the suggested people to follow on Instagram a platform he believes has democratized the ability to create great photographs. So we're all here in our hangout, and we're going to talk photography and art. I am going to begin with you, Simon. And what I'm going to start off with is the idea that for many years, photography had a kind of lower status when compared with contemporary art. Art historians perhaps didn't take photography quite as seriously as, uh, uh, as they did fine art, unless it was kind of hung on a wall, it wasn't taken seriously at all. Do you think these prejudices are changing? And if they are, why? Oh, that's a great question, or a great series of questions. So really, if we think about it, if we think about the history of history of art altogether, photography has always been there, right from the very beginning. Photographers were arguing that the, what they were doing was fine art and was, was should be treated equally and, and on the same level. But that really was a, a long battle that photographers were, were trying to, to fight. And in fact, um, at certain moments in, in the history of art, photographers are extremely successful at being taken seriously. If we think about Man Ray and the surrealism in the 1920s, you have an incredible um, moment where photographers were really treated very equally. If we also think about the Bauhaus, this great kind of design and art school, we have some of the most famous photographers of the 20th century working alongside painters. So there are these great moments where photography is treated equally. But then likewise, as you say, um, in other times, we, we look around art galleries and we see photography strangely missing. So I think that there is a, um, there's a, a tension within the way we understand history of art where photography sometimes takes, takes its place alongside other media and sometimes seems to slip into the background. To disappear. I'd like to bring in somebody from the Google Hangout area, somebody not with me. Um, and I don't mind which of you, you three answer this question, but uh, what I wanted to ask is, um, about the relationship that photography has with the public. So uh, the public generally has been always quite pro-photography, it seems to me. So, um, I mean, even if you think with, about within Tate Britain, there was a, uh, we've had a, a kind of great success with the show that was shown during the Olympics in 2012. And uh, in, uh, in how, in 2007, is this right, the first ever photography show at Tate was shown? Just want to check this. Uh, might be right. No, I think called How We Are Photographing Britain, that and that was a big, massively yeah. successful show. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask, um, and anybody on my little hangout area out there can answer this one: Why you think photography has always resonated with the public, perhaps more greatly than it has done with experts? Who wants to answer? You can wave or you can shout. I'm going to ask you to answer. Okay, I'm going to throw it to Michael. Why do you think it uh, resonates more with the public? Unmute myself. I think uh, there's just a lot more images in the world right now. Uh, the apps like Instagram with 150 million users, uh, it's just more in the public mainstream. We're looking at stuff um, every day. There's so many images flying by you. 
uh, and I think people have a greater appreciation um, for photography because they see it so much and uh, a great image has to cut through all of this clutter because there are so many images out there in the world. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of how I feel right now. There's something we, something we might say to address that as well. When you mentioned the, another London show at Tate Britain last year, many of those photographs would originally have been in, in magazines and more popular uh, forums. And, and in fact, one of the things we could say about photography is it sometimes changes its um, its mode of understanding from something very, very with a very broad audience to then being put in a museum wall. And I think that that may be an interesting thing to think about as well. That yeah. that. We, we may be familiar with photographs all around us, but what will make us stop and look in a museum and treat that photograph differently? Do you find, Miles, as a kind of working photographer, that your work is taken more seriously? We have a book here of your work. Do you find it's taken more seriously in a, in, if it's presented in a book form, format than it is perhaps if it's presented in a magazine format? Um, <clears throat> we reach a different audience, obviously. Uh, you know, the magazines I work for, like Italian Vogue, they probably have a sort of readership of about 20,000, whereas a, a book can, uh, along with an exhibition, can, you know, reach, uh, well, hopefully, more than that. <laughs> um, yeah, and also a very different audience, obviously. Sort of my, my work is, uh, you know, begins as fashion photography. You can but, see some of your work now, actually. Oh. It's coming up. But I mean, do you get, just simply by giving it a status of being in a book or perhaps, you know, hung in a yeah. photographic exhibition, that changes the, the way that people feel about a photograph? I, I think it does. Even, even for, my, for myself, uh, you know, I, my, um, the first gallery that exhibited me, uh, they found my work in Italian Vogue and asked me to exhibit. And so it was actually the first time I'd see, uh, see my work in that different context as it, of it being... Uh, Presented as art, as it were. Uh, but once I once I started that kind of um, conversation back and forth with the gallery, it then kind of grew and grew. Did and you feel more differently? Did you feel different about I your did work? Did feel very different about it, yeah. Because the original intention for the work was really to do images that would actually it's interesting here in the chat earlier speaking about so many images in the world. Actually, my intention has always been to create images that stop that kind of hideous magazine flicking through images and images. So. You know, when I started to work for Italian Vogue, I tried to do images that were quite kind of uh, beautiful, but rather um, uh, shocking too, in a way. So uh, you weren't quite sure if you had been uh, attracted by the imagery or repulsed by it, you know. But it, it had the effects of stopping people turning the pages. And actually, the image that the uh, the gallery spotted in Italian Vogue that they wanted to present as art was simply an egg with a cigarette stubbed out in it. Uh, and I'm, I managed to get that put into Italian Vogue because there was a little bit of lipstick on the cigarette, and that lipstick could be discussed as a, a colour for women to wear. Um, and that's, yeah. you know, when stubbing their cigarette out on the yeah, neck. Yeah. So that's how it went, yeah. Um, I'm going to kind of throw a quote out now, and I'm going to throw it to Fiona. Um, and it is a, a quote from a, from a, a photographer from Lord Snowden, it says, uh, this is what he said once, photography is not art, it's about moving levers and pressing buttons. People like me took up photography because we could not draw. Would you agree with him? It's an interesting quote, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I like the idea of put, uh, kind of pushing levers. I don't yeah, know quite yeah, what yeah, he's yeah. been taking yeah, photographs on. Yeah, yeah, like it's just completely mechanical. Um, I mean, in some respects it is, um, pushing levers and... Um, and uh, using an instrument like that, using a tool. But I think um, you, you can't just see it only in that context because as soon as you start to make an image, then you have to think about its aesthetic qualities, its formal qualities, its conceptual qualities. So I think it's, um, I'm, I'm not sure how tongue in cheek Lord Snowden was when, when he was saying this because I think we've gone far beyond the idea that drawing is a way of making art or an exclusive way of making art. Yeah. Do you, do you think, I mean, this is again thrown to kind of anyone, do you think that there is a, a certain amount of technique that's needed in order to be a photographic artist? Yeah. Well, speaking as somebody who's completely useless with any form of camera, <laughs> I would say absolutely. There's, there's, but there is, a, there is that residual sense that... Um, and in fact, some of the very first photographs ever made in the beginning of the 19th century were described as 
this is the first building ever to draw its own picture. You know, the idea that it's completely automatic, that it just happens, um, all of us know that that's not true. When, when we've tried to make, make photographs with anything more complicated maybe than an iPhone, you get the, you get the, the light setting wrong, you get the speed wrong, you, you make mistakes. So there's an enormous skill set that, that you need in order to, to make certain kinds of photography. And then what's happened, obviously, technologically, is that there are other kinds of photographic apparatus that need less of a skill set. So I'm great with an iPhone, and probably <laughs> most of us are, um, but, but I wouldn't be able to operate the, 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 um, the, the equipment that, that Miles uses. But I think that's true of all art, isn't it? That, you know, I mean, all these turners in this room here were painted by somebody who studied the use of oil paint and stretching canvases and... Uh, probably did some classes on perspective, even though it's not really apparent. Um, and, you know, even to even Lord Snowden's quotes, I mean, he, he, you know, the idea that you can't use a pen, I mean, someone has to have a talent to use a pencil, just like you have to have a talent to use a, a camera. I think all art is a sort of uh, a, a mixing of uh, the imagination with the technical. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to also, I'd like to bring in Gregory, because you haven't actually spoken, Greggy. Hello. <laughs> there you are. How nice to see you. Um, as a kind of editor, a commissioning editor, um, do you, I mean, what you're looking for, obviously, is kind of artwork in, in photography. I wanted to slightly um, open it out a little bit. Do you think that um, the work that you see has been affected by the moving image, which is obviously another thing that's completely altered uh, art generally, but do you find that that's... Um, that's changing photography, the work that you see? Um, I mean, a lot of people are submitting to us now like things called photo films, which are kind of um, photographs. Well, they, they once would have been photographs, but now they're kind of short documentaries. Um, but in terms of the still image, I wouldn't say that it's affected it um, personally. Yeah. Um, Do you find that things like social media have affected the work that you've been sent in? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, like, the way that we look at information now um, in kind of disparate strands um, is kind of falling into art. Um, that didn't make much sense in a sentence. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one, uh, one thing that's remarkable about that is that now you don't have to decide before you set out whether you're going to make a moving image or a still image because yeah. the, the same apparatus can be used to make both. And I think that's. That well, is. By mistake. Yeah, I, I find mean, it. If you, if that happens. <laughs> that happens. You know, we press the wrong button. That's completely revolutionary. If you think about it in historic terms, uh, if you were going to make a documentary, you had to take a film camera with you. If you wanted to make still photographs, you had to take a still camera with you. Yeah. Now you can go out to make still photographs and decide to make a small video. This is an amazing, uh, amazing kind of blurring now of the boundaries that you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'd like to actually, if we can, run a, a kind of VT now, uh, a Don McCullum VT. It, he's talking in 2012 uh, for uh, a show that there was on at, at Tate. It was a, showed his documentary work rather than his kind of wall work um, and his landscapes. And I'd just like to run this VT because it actually picks up on something that you've just been talking about and then we can move on to photography as the idea of a kind of real medium. I had a very, very close association with London, having been born in London and having been born on the wrong side of the tracks, as they say. And I started seeing people sleeping in shop doorways. And when I went to third world countries, people would refuse to believe there were poor people in England. But there were many, many untold truths about this country. We had poverty, we had unemployment, we had you know, we had a class system that wasn't convenient and all kinds of things that people who lived outside of England wouldn't have understood. So when I started walking the streets of London and seeing people sleeping in shop doorways, even I was shocked. What I tried to do is I tried to draw those people into my, my vision. I, I, I tried to make myself unimportant in the presence of such people. And I tried to let their eyes meet my eyes, which I think in many cases I've managed to succeed. I want them to see I am no harm, no threat to them. I want them to see that I'm looking at them through a pair of eyes that have enormous compassion and understanding. Don McCullum's uh, photographs are generally considered, obviously, to be powerful, but also incredibly moving. Um, and I think that it's very interesting that he said that one of the, the ways that he could get those photographs is actually by bringing his self, himself as a person, 
into the, the, the way that he gets to photographs. He, he says he lets them know that he has compassion. Um, I find that interesting given that pho photographs are generally assumed as a, as, a, as a medium to be something that is real. You're just documenting something that's there. It's not you. You don't bring anything to it. You just turn up, you take a photograph, and that's a real thing. He's slightly skewing that, isn't he? John McCullen's you know, work has been, and his life has been dedicated to bringing images forward that, that we otherwise wouldn't have seen. And I think that the, the first decision that a photographer makes, which is so important, so creative, is what to look at. You know, what is it that, you know, basically in those images that we were seeing, Don McCullum was photographing people that we, we would avoid looking at, the, the people that you ignore when you're walking down the street, the, the, the homeless person sleeping in a, in a doorway. He, he made the decision to not to ignore those things and to actually focus upon them. And, but also, more than that, he also, as he said, brought his own... Um, his own background to the way that he did that. And if you look at those images, some of those portraits, they have an incredible sense of the history of portraiture, of the history of, of the social commentary. And you can see, you could, I mean, at a stretch, you could see Hogarth in some of those pictures. You know, the idea that you're, you're showing um, another side of the life of London. Um, you're showing something that, the, that most people don't consider to be um, worthy of attention. I think that's that's a really powerful function that photography has to make us look at things that we that we otherwise wouldn't. And to make us look, I mean, not just look at things that we otherwise wouldn't, perhaps look in a different way as well. Do you think that's true? Yeah, and I think that's that's where where the, the idea of the photographer as an artist comes in, of course, because the you know the camera is uh, just a just a tool, just a machine. You know, it's com completely objective, and if one was uh, if one was able to operate it without any um, feeling or any imagination, it would just literally record uh, the world. But actually, because there's a human being at the other side of it, viewing through the lens, and uh, Diane Arbus was very clear about this when she's, she said that when she went into a room to take a photograph or when she met someone to photograph, you know, rather than rearranging the room, she would move herself to find the position to take the, the picture from. And so there's a sort of, you know, that's her decision to see this person or this room from that place. and that. I think just that simple act is being an artist, is where to position, position the camera, how to tell the story, how to um, create symbols within the image. It's interesting for me seeing those Don McCullen pictures. I like all of them because he's, he's a great photographer. But the one of the, 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 uh, the tramp sleeping with the bollard leaning towards him seems to be of a whole other category of brilliance because it's got this surrealist Freudian thing going on as well as just documenting London and I think that's what great artists do is that they, they you know they, they see the world but then there's this whole other um, pantomime and uh, theatre that are going on inside their own heads from their childhood from memory from things they've read all of that and these things meet and that's why for John, Don McCullen I imagine this leaning bollard was also interesting Fiona, what about you? I mean, did you do you find that the idea that a photograph is more real in inverted commas than uh, than a, a painting or a, a, you know a film, I suppose? Um, has that affected your work, or do you ignore that kind of that that kind of strand? <laughs> well, I, I think it's um, it's a, it's a myth that uh, that a photograph is a real um, depiction of the world. You know, it, it never was, and it it still isn't because I think. I think all um, photographers or, or artists who use photography are constructing um, the world. They're reconstructing the world in some way, um, shape or form. And um, I think that, uh, you know, j just that photography is not how our eyes see. You know, we don't, we don't have everything kind of collapsed down on one plane. We can only have um, we can only have a certain depth of focus. We can't see what's far away and what's right up close to us at the same time. So um, I think that the interesting thing is that uh, that there's still this kind of myth that persists that um, that photography is a kind of naturalised way of looking. And I, and I think the other thing that's really interesting. Um, now in a contemporary sense is that so much of our um, relationship with the world is, is mediated through screens. 
in some way, shape or form. Um, right and, you know, whether it's, yeah, exactly, whether it's the computer screen or um, the television screen uh, or, or the car windscreen. I did a set of works that were taken through car windscreen. So, so I think that, um, you know, when, when we look through screens, we don't see the ground, you know, we, do, we have things framed and cropped. And, and these are all, they, these are all constructions um, in some way. Yeah, interesting. I'd like to, can we show some, uh, we have some photographs of uh, Shaw and Moriyama, can we, can we put those, ping them up and we can have a quick look? Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> and here we have, Shaw, Simon, I'm going to throw to you, would you, would you yeah, like here, to here talk about Here we have more this? of the, the real unmediated um, world um, of Chris Shaw. Chris Shaw is an, in, an incredibly interesting photographer who started um, his um, started his career um, thinking about photographing the world around him and had this moment in his life where he was found himself homeless and needed somewhere to, to live and got a job as a night porter. And this, many of the works we're showing at, at Tate Britain at the moment is this series, Life as a Night Porter. So he would carry around a, it's actually quite contemporary when you think about it, he would carry around this little disposable camera. He would photograph things happening in the hotel at night and then he would go to the dark room and print up these beautiful black and white prints of... Of, um, of various happenings in the hotel at night, and I think this um, this really underlines what what Fiona's saying about the um, the kind of mediation of photography. Of course, it's not transparent. It's a completely constructed, mediated um, kind of uh, uh, way of seeing the world. But it is something that's nevertheless very it can be very immediate to our lives. You can really um, show exactly what was happening around you. I, I love the work um, by Chris Shaw when he's showing kind of naked men locked out of their hotel rooms at night. That he has to he has to escort them back to their hotel room, and he would say that you know after his, photographing them. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the, these guys would take the wrong door out of their room, think they were going to the bathroom, end up naked in the corridor, and he would walk them back to their room, and he'd take a picture of them, and um, that would become you know that's a, a view that of themselves that they would never see. Obviously, you see yourself walking away from yourself naked at night. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think there's something um, quite remarkable about this sense of, of re-showing us the world that we already know. We already know these things happen. Um, and another thing that Fiona said that's fascinating, obviously we haven't mentioned this, but we talked about Don McCullen, we talked about Chris Shaw and Dido Moriyama. They all work quite pro predominantly in black and white. And of course the world's not black and white, we know that. But nowadays we're all much more familiar with this idea of the mediations of photography through things like Instagram, because you can turn your beautiful photograph or your, or your not so beautiful photo off yeah. into a very beautiful black and white image. Uh, so these kinds of things remind us, Instagram reminds us that the, photo, that the photographic process was always about selection, editing, filters. cropping, yeah. filters. Choices. Choices, yeah. Choices. yeah. yeah. We're gonna, we are actually going to be talking about that a little bit later. But before we do, I thought it would be quite, might be quite nice, uh, given that we just talked about, I suppose, kind of slightly reportage, although, you know, not reportage as we've unpicked, um, as a style of photography. I'd also like to talk about fashion photography um, because they're seen as actually two completely different things, aren't they? Yeah. Fashion photography is seen as something that is constructed. It requires a whole team, a lovely hotel, stylists, beautiful models. <laughs> get looked out of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, it's very much the opposite of somebody yeah. just kind of rocking up with a, with a small camera. Although, of course, the two things do interchange, and there, are, there is a style yes. of fashion photography which is just somebody taking pictures on, yeah. you know, uh, an instamatic. But, yeah. yes, I see your point. Yeah, I mean, do, is there, is there, uh, I mean, you know, if, if one was being completely cynical, would you say that um, all fashion photography is, in the end, advertising or not? No, I wouldn't at all. I, I, I mean, I like to um, take Richard Avedon and, and then Helmut Newton as great guides in this. And uh, for me, they were both artists who not only documented the latest sort of Balenciaga or Dior outfits. What's that? Um, but, um, you know, also, I mean, I really feel that, you know, post-war uh, New York and post-war Paris comes through the feelings of that, that life, those worlds, uh, come through in the pictures of Avedon. And similarly, in Newton's pictures from the 70s, you get a sense of the sort of the darkness of the kind of, you know, drug culture and sort of the sexual culture that was going on in, in Newton's work. And, you know, this has got nothing to do with the clothes. The clothes are there. People wear clothes. Mm -hmm. It's a consequence of not being locked out of a hotel room, I suppose. <laughs> but, you know, the clothes are there. And, I, I mean, I, I think when people went to see my exhibition at Somerset House, I don't think, I hope, I don't feel that many people left that show feeling that they'd seen a lot of 
photographs of clothes. I believe they saw photographs of humans. Yeah, and also roles. Reenacting right? roles, yes, characters. Yeah. Um, so. Female roles, very, mu yeah, very much yeah. so. I so I think that's why fashion photography has been sort of, you know, uh, in the last 15 years, been, been drawn into being considered as art. Yeah. Uh, and you, because in uh, a way, it's just another another point of view. Yeah. Um, um, then we've got a little bit of a VT of you actually, which I'd like to show, and then perhaps you could you could talk about it because it has a sure. kind of art reference. No, I wonder what Mark Gertler would make of all of this. The camera was just in its infancy in 1916. The idea of photography as art is, is still very far away from his experience of photography. Yeah, do you want to explain what what, what was you, I doing what, there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was I was uh, I wanted to do a project that was a, a response to a painting that's actually here at Tate Britain, which is by Mark Gertler, painted in 1916 called The Merry-Go-Round. And it's a painting I've always loved. Um, it has this kind of strange quality of almost being like a, 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 an Edwardian pop art painting, because uh, there's elements of Peter Blake in there in, in a way. Um, it's got this sort of, it's very British, but it's broken down to these very simple colors and the characters, the roles, the soldier, the sailor, the, the young ladies, the little boy, are very um, uh, generic and, and it, uh, almost like kind of cutouts from a from a from a pop art, you know, painting. Um, and so the idea was to do a photographic kind of response to this work, yeah. um, and um, just to sort of see where that would take me, really. And so it was, the, for me, it became an exercise in uh, the roles again, the, the, the characters and color and performance. And cropping, uh, and uh, and as as I discovered, this was a very recent project. Um, like all my work, there's there's the idea, but you're very much led by where the camera takes you. And uh, as a photographer, uh, you ha you you have an idea, but you the, the camera sort of speaks back to you and shows you what's working, what's not working. And again, in this kind of DNR, it's where you move your camera to find the position. That's the true of all creative. Uh, creative efforts, isn't it? You have perhaps have an idea of what you think you're going to achieve, and then actually the process takes you perhaps yes. somewhere well, else. There's those two analogies of sculpture, isn't there? There's, a, the, the, there's the one sculpture that's kind of constructed and built uh, from the ground up, and then there's the other one that the sculptor sees this piece of work inside the stone and carves a way to get to it. You know, um, I think photography is more the former, that you're kind of constructing this thing as you go along, and you sort of um, things things reveal themselves to you as, as you go. Um. Okay. Um, hello. Are you still there down there? My lovely Google Hangout people down video. We're going to uh, move on now and to the emergence of social media. And I know that, Michael, you have quite a lot to say about this. I want to ask you a very straightforward <laughs> question, which is, is the Instagram selfie art? <laughs> Can it be? <laughs> um. I, I believe so. I, I believe so. I think um, anyone can capture uh, an instant moment, but it still has to be memorable and timeless. You know, I, I ask myself this question every time I'm scrolling through hundreds of images a day, <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, you know, what's standing out? What's, cut, what's cutting through the clutter here? And um, I think it's possible for it to become art. Some of the images you're looking at on screen right now are from a photo show that I'm curating, which is all iPhone photos, all portraits. Um, and we're trying to take these iPhone images and put them on gallery walls. And to say, hey, you know, like uh, a great image is a great image, no matter what kind of camera you use. You know, storytelling, uh, subject matter, lighting composition, all hold true in a great image, whether you're using an iPhone or a Hasselblad. So why can't these be considered art? Why can't we frame them really well and, put, and, and present them well? Uh, so I, I think it's possible, but like I said earlier, there's so many images to look through it. You really have to have a strong point of view as a photographer and an artist to sort of cut through the clutter. Um, and 
you know, I've noticed a lot of great photographers that can't shoot on an iPhone, and I've seen photographers uh, spawn careers off iPhone, and now they're shooting professionally. And I think that's really fascinating. Uh, it's very Will it work? I mean, just a quick question about if you if yeah. you take the if you take that image out of the iPhone, you know, size, I suppose, really. If you, I mean, it's designed to be small. Yeah. grab you very quickly I mean if you take that out and put it on a wall in a kind of contemporary a classic no, a classic kind of uh, museum way will that will that not kind of kill those images uh, no I think it elevates the quality like Fiona was saying uh, earlier uh, everyone's looking to see everything uh, every everyone sees images on screens these days and to take a little 640 by 640 pixel image and uh, blow it up on the wall to you know 12 inches by 12 inches. I think there's an intimacy uh, that you, that the viewer has when looking at the print, and I, I think it definitely elevates it um, quite quite a bit. You know, the the interesting thing about uh, the apps like Instagram is uh, the sharing aspect, how people can get feedback on their images really quickly, and how it inspires them to go out into the world and see the world differently and be more creative and that's very, very powerful to me. It is powerful. It also can be very brutal, <laughs> to be honest. You can put something up and everyone tell you, tell you it's rubbish. Yeah, that. yeah, it's true. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, it's, people are very honest, and, and I appreciate that. I think it pushes people to, 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 to see the world, find beauty in the mundane, and people with no photographic training uh, start finding these little creative impulses. And that, to me, is like very, very powerful. I, I, I'm excited to see how it goes. And again, yes, there's a lot of crap out there. Excuse my language. So you really <laughs> need right. to. We, we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Gregory, I just wanted to ask you: Do you do you find that? So, I mean, obviously, an Instagram is a very particular way of looking at photographs. It's very quick. You scroll through. Has that affected the way that you present images in a magazine as well? I can't hear you. I'm afraid. Can we hear Gregory? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah, hello. Yeah. <laughs> um, not particularly. I mean, what we look for in the photographs that we show in Hot Shoe isn't necessarily the aesthetic, but it's the, the kind of concept that comes along with them and the idea. Um, so, I mean, whether a, a pitch has been on Instagram, like, doesn't really make that much difference to us. It's almost the opposite, then, isn't it? Really, I mean, if you that what you because Instagram quite often is almost devoid of context. There's no time to give it a context. Whereas you're actually talking about something completely different. You're talking about photography in a completely different way. Yeah, I mean, like most of the images on Instagram kind of would fall into like useful photography uh, as a category for us. So like stock photography or vernacular photography or a diary of your diet, um, but not necessarily art. Um, as as oh, oh, controversy. <laughs> Michael, will you want to step in? <laughs> That's not to say that all of it isn't art. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there are uh, quite a few artists that use iPhone only and, uh, that have elevated um, the art form. I just think a great image transcends the type of camera you use. Uh, I, re I really, really do. Um, uh, yes, it's easy to use an iPhone, but you still have to have a, st a story to tell, like uh, Miles was saying, and, and a strong point of view. Um, it really doesn't matter. It's just a tool. It's just a tool. Okay. Simon, I'm going to ask you, are you about to put a show on of uh, Instagram photos? Well, you know what's really interesting is that the, the museum is the destination for... The museum is where things end up after they've been filtered and screened over many years. And, in fact, really... Um, we could say the same about many kinds of photography that end up in museums, that that wasn't, that wasn't the original reason that they were made. We could think about August Sander making commercial portraits that are now treated in this very reverential way. We could talk about some of the photographers that you mentioned, that Avedon and Newton. William Klein, we had a huge show of Klein. He did a lot of great work for magazines and photo books. The, the medium for William Klein was, was the photo book, and yet now we make exhibitions and we show them on the wall. And I think, really, the museum is a great place to see things, to think about them, to ha have a little bit of time around the object. And I think what you were describing of scrolling through, that really tells us something about uh, one way of understanding images. Another way is to just take one of them out, put it on the wall, and look at it for 10 minutes rather than 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
is the that's the job of the museum. It means that we're editorial. That it, inevitably, museums have to be editorial, but that's not a problem. And, and time is also editorial. So we will find out in 50 years' time whether any of the Instagram or iPhone artists are, are ranked alongside um, some of their peers yeah. who use Hasselblad or whatever. Time is a very brief curiosity, isn't it, really? Uh, Fiona, you've made the fantastically interesting point about us looking at screens and and using it. So I just wanted I just wanted to ask you, um, given that your work is actually kind of installation, it's very it's actually completely mm -hmm. different from yeah. what we were talking about Instagram or even on the walls. Um, do you deliberately move away from our contemporary? way of looking at screens there? Um, I, th I, th I think it, it, it's really interesting because I, I think, you know, we, we've been speaking about a huge range, you know, from reportage to fashion photography yeah. to, um, you know, constructed artworks. Um, and I think that through all of those, there's this um, desire for a kind of a material presence or to um, experience a photograph as an object in front of you in a space and I think to a large extent that's what museums do they they create this context for the work to be in um, and I think you know my, my background is actually as a sculptor um, I've never trained officially as a, as a photographer although um, everything I've learned I've learned as I needed it along the way um, but my real interest is in um, the photograph or a group of photographs as, as a sort of physical presence in a, in a space. So yeah. um, their relationship to us um, as, a, you know, our scale and to the scale and the, um, the presence of the architecture um, is, is what I'm interested in. So, so those images that, um, that have been put up of um, the installation at Matt's gallery last yeah. year, um, the, the photographs actually came off the wall, you know, and, and I situated them in the space of the viewer. And so as, as, um, as the viewer walked around, there was also seating in the space. So the, the, the viewer was kind of framing and reframing the work um, yeah. as, as they were moving around the space. So moving through it. it it's it's, it's, it's putting, putting the viewer in this um, kind of position of kind of creating views and compositions. Um, as well as myself as the, as the kind of choreographer of that kind of act of viewing. Um, so completely different, I have to say. So Maya, I'm going to throw to you the very last, uh, last thing before we, before we wrap up. We have done a kind of huge yes, roundup. Sorry, a very, in a very small, <laughs> a very small yeah. amount of time. Sure. Um, I'd just like you, I suppose, just to mention a couple of uh, photographs that have, uh, you've mentioned a couple of uh, works that have influenced you, but if you wanted to, people to take something away from our talk about photography, what would it be? Gosh, um, other than to see more, I don't, I'm yeah. not sure what else to say really. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't feel photography needs a defender. I mean, it's clearly uh, loved and adored and uh, it's great shows at Tate, modern Tate Britain on photography. Um, bookshops are full. in many different ways, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I suppose when I started photography about 18 years ago, um, the books on photography were there, were, there were fewer books on photography. And now, you know, uh, there's probably as many books on photography as there is on painting, possibly more, I would say, in my local bookshop when I kind of go in. It's a very popular um, medium. I think, uh, as I said, doesn't need any kind of defending. <laughs> yeah, we don't defend it. We support uh, it. Yes. <laughs> so look, I'm going to have to. I'm sorry, we have to wind up. It's the nature of these things that we get a conversation going, and then we have to go like that. But I'd like to say thank you very much to um, everyone down the line. I'm waving at you, Fiona, Thanks. Gregory, and Michael. Bye. Thank you to Simon, and thank you to Miles, and thank, thank you. you to everyone for watching.